Hello and welcome to my hobby room. This video is a slightly different video to usual, as for the first time I actually have a guest. Joining me today is my friend called Lee, who has made this amazing terrain that you see here, and with whom I play an awesome game in a 1 to 300 scale. So without any further ado, I will get him to join me and we will have a conversation about this terrain and the game that we play on it. Hmm. Hi Lee, thanks for joining me on Beard Clever. It's nice to have you with me. Nice to be here. So I mentioned in the introduction that this is a 1 to 300 scale terrain and the game that we're playing on it, Challenger 2000, mm -hmm. uh, is uh, not, not in any scale but works well on that scale. Uh, how did you come to get into this scale? It's not one that I've played with before. Um, well, I was always uh, interested in, in modern wargaming, mm -hmm. tanks, etc. And um, it was a friend of mine, we were gaming with, with airfix models and, and other scales. Yeah. And obviously to do it on a tabletop, everything always looked a bit absurd, you know, yeah, a bit absurd. A bit too close. A bit certainly close, yeah. Mm -hmm. and, um, and he came out with the box, this is about 30 years ago, um, with a few of these what he called micro tanks. Mm -hmm. And there was three or four, they were all, it was all World War II, mm -hmm. um, three or four tanks and then some, you know, jeeps and, and petrol tankers. Mm -hmm. And of course it's like, wow, this is, this is perfect. <laughs> it know, actually can, looks right. You could actually have a game on a table mm -hmm. with, with tanks and, you know, it, it, it looked, it worked. Mm -hmm. So, um, in those days, we'd say we didn't have many of the miniatures, but we made some moulds and, and made some pretty poor duplicates. <laughs> and that gave us sort of a few tanks each. And um, yeah, we, we made a board and, and some terrain and felt some rules. And uh, that was the start of 1 to 300, yeah. Excellent. The shot now shows some of the amazing terrain that you've made. It is, frankly, inspirational. Where did you start with, with this artwork? Um, well, thanks very much. <laughs> uh, yeah, it was... Um, uh, I, I didn't rush in. I put a lot of thought into um, how big each individual tile or, or piece should be. And there was little point in... Um, and using sort of 20 by 20 or 30 by 30. It needed to be more serious. But of course, I also wanted something which was modular. And so I came up with, um, with the, the size of the boards that you see here um, for infantry and small arms fire. It's possible to just to get one out mm -hmm. and, and have a small skirmish. Uh, and indeed, you can have two or three or four, as many as you wish. But um, with all of the considerations, the uh, ease of setup, um, transport and storage and all those sorts mm. of things. So it's sort of about a, a 75 by, by a 45, 50 uh, board and that seemed to be, to be about right. Once you had decided on the size, you had to decide how to actually go about making this. Can you tell me about that? Yeah. Um, well, the key, the key thing is I wanted it to be independent. Mm -hmm. um, and as we know, your standard kitchen table is always a bit too low for... It's okay if you're doing board gaming and you're mm -hmm. sitting at the table. Mm -hmm. But if, if you want to have a, a serious game, A, you usually end up with problems with the wife because the game's out on the kitchen table for too long. Mm -hmm. And B, it's usually just too low. Um, so I wanted a, um, an independent setup which would allow to have you know, a correct height for gaming, for mm -hmm. adults. And um, as I say, modular and independent. So the design of the frames and the legs, these legs here are all what I call end legs. And then... Uh, in between the two, there's T-piece legs, mm -hmm. which feed into both. And of course, you can use these any way you, you wish. So we've got two, two rows of four here, but you can have, you can have it lengthways. Or, you know, yeah, any, so co any combination. Any yeah. combination. 
Yeah. And of course it's independent, so it, it stands on its own. It looks pretty solid. That's yeah. serious it's, it's, framework, that. It's not bad. It was actually built by... Um, obviously, I did the boards and everything else, but I actually commissioned a guy um, who was a custom bike uh, master, if you like, building mm. uh, choppers and, and, and Harley Davidson and things. and. Um, yeah, he, he had a, some great metalwork skills. I said, look, you know, th this is my, I need these frames, I need these legs, and I told him about my idea, and, uh, and he made everything for me. And it's uh, amazing. There's, there's um, a little moral to the story there, you know, if uh, we all like to do everything ourselves, but occasionally it does pay to, to bring in some help. With the frames in place, which makes it sturdy and means that you can transport it, and put it up and leave it up. What? Tell me next about the actual scenery. It, it is really stunning. I, I, I stand and look at it for quite a long time and I have guests and they spend their time, they spend more time looking at this than any other thing in the building. Tell, tell me about the actual terrain and the scenery and how you went about doing that. Um, okay, well, I mean, the, the, the actual, uh, the boards are just hardboard mm -hmm. from B&Q or doing that sort of thing. <laughs> Your, um, other, other hardware suppliers are available. Yeah, that's right, yes, that's uh, not an advert. <laughs> <laughs> not in bed and being kids. But, um, <laughs> more's the shame. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no discounts for me. Um, and one of the things I, whenever I've, I've modelled, whether it's just dioramas or, or um, trains or slot racing, whatever, I, I do like the grass on a roll purely because it, it sort of, it completely covers an area. You can put your scatter material on afterwards, mm -hmm. of course, but I, I like the, the completeness, and like it's a wrap. And, um, <clears throat> and of course, one of the challenges when you're doing a large model is to actually get all the same color grass. And, uh, yes. You know, getting your materials. Um, the, the buildings are mostly uh, resin. There are a few pewter ones from GCHQ, but um, as with all of these things, you know, you're, you're looking for 1 to 285, 1 to 300 scale. Um, it's not like going and shopping for trainers and flip flops, so I had to do some research. And bearing in mind, I started this uh, 15 years ago, <laughs> so huh. um, there might well be more available now than there was in those days. But um, yeah, so eventually I, I had a very large box of, of, uh, of all of these buildings which were all in need of a paint job. Uh, and that alone, you know, before I even started building the, uh, the actual terrain, obviously there was a lot, of, a lot of late nights just painting these buildings and making them look uh, good enough. Um, the trees obviously are... Um, are bought, I didn't make them, and, um, and obviously the, the great thing at this scale is they're not actually that expensive, so <laughs> you can, you can, bulk you can buy plant them. a yeah. wood fairly economically. Yeah. Yes. And the, um, uh, underneath the, uh, the grass wrap, if you like, there's polystyrene tiles which have been cut into contours. Mm -hmm. um, the depth of polystyrene, give or take, works as a sort of a hull down position for a tank behind two contours you're out of sight. I'm very impressed you didn't say Goridolo then. Goridolo, <laughs> yeah. I knew you did. I knew you did. <laughs> and, um, yeah, obviously there's scatter material here. The, the hedges are all made um, using, uh, you know, pipes of uh, PVA glue and then the, the material are scattered and, and shaped. Mm -hmm. The stone walls are all individual stones, which again is uh, a line of PVA glue. I'm not just saying this, uh, but I used that technique myself, having picked it from you. So there we are. Oh, okay. Well, there I'm, we are. You're an inspiration. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. It works well. Yeah, because you know you, you can't buy a wall this size. No. With with that sort of level of detail, no. you, you have to do it yourself. Yeah. And um, and when you've got a lot to do. Um, falls rush in. Mm. So again, I experimented on, on with various methods and ideas, and then when I had something that I thought 
uh, worked, was fairly simple and, and easy to deploy. I rolled it out across the, across the, uh, the various boards. Now, obviously there are eight boards in front of us. Talk to me about how you have designed and planned them to work both in joining together and also to give variety and variation for it as a gaming table. Yeah, well, the, uh, the secret, I guess, is sort of less is more, although parts of it do look quite busy. Um, it's definitely a case of, of having balance and because all of these boards can be deployed you know, any which way you, you choose, the idea was really to, to try and ensure that 60 or 70% of the terrain was fairly open. So like on the far side over there, you've got quite a long run, haven't you? Going up towards the airport. Yeah, yeah, with tank, with tank battles of course they can engage at, at three or four kilometers away uh -huh. modern battle tanks so um they become uh, uh highly effective at 2k in but that's a lot of space so um you don't want to have a situation where it's so busy that there's no acquisitions or or direct fire yes until you're in a situation where everyone's being hit and instantly destroyed. Yeah, whites of their eyes, yeah. Yeah. So I mean, we've got a situation here where where my my Russian tanks are engaging you at about a K and a half. Um, because the Challenger 2 has got, you know, very strong front armour. Um, I think three or four of them have bounced off, haven't they? Yes, that's been a bit frustrating. There's a couple of S's which stands for suppressed, which means I heard that, but I just heard it. Yeah, well, you, you probably maybe have ringing ears and maybe yeah. bleeding nose, but your machine's still in one piece. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas over here, you'll see there's one that's uh, on its side. I got you back for Steve, didn't I? You did get me back. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, that's the difference in the tech. But we'll come up, we'll come on to that uh, in another section. So you've got the very variety. You've got the town here. You've got a little bit of a, of the sea there, and then um, over in that corner, we've decided that that's where the um, airport is. Uh, talk about how the the eight tiles work together because they do they can really be joined in pretty much any order, can't they? Absolutely, yes. The only one that actually is is slightly the other one out is, is of course the what I call the lighthouse board. Mm -hmm. There's a little bit of, of sea here, and of course this has to go on a corner. Yeah, because um, there's nothing. There's no road yeah, there's joining, no joining yeah. to the sea. Yeah. Um, so this is sort of the odd one out, and as you can see, there's also some river on this board, um, which again comes off the, if you like, the dead side and, and, and the secondary dead side. Yes. And there's also a piece of railway here that runs to a siding. So everything's designed. Um, this was the odd one out, which was, which allowed me to to do some creative things, knowing yes. that there'd be no connectivity in mm -hmm. these two sides. The rest of them, however, all the roads go off at the, the centres. So, you know, you can swip, you know, switch them around, turn them around, put them whichever way you like, and they'll always, they'll always match up. Some challenge, that. Yeah, uh, it was a challenge, actually, to make it look not too contrived. Yeah, keeping it natural, absolutely. Keeping it natural, yes, but still with, with that modular format. And then even on this one, you can see that there's a, a road here and there's a road here, which I quite like the way that it goes to a little um, parking area that fits very well with this board. We put this together very much as a collaborative process. What you see in front, we kind of decided where do we want things to be. Mm. Uh, and it was nice. It was almost starting to tell a story, which is getting onto another subject. But it was starting to tell a story of this land that we're looking at that we're going to be fighting over. And the fact that we were able to place these, these boards in any order, really, allowed that creative process to really flow, didn't it? It was, it was fun. Mm. It, it was playing a game before the game even started, almost. Yeah, writing that story. If, if you were playing, uh, dare I say, at a competition level, I mean, myself and a friend used to... 
we used to actually have a budget of £100 each and a main battle tank would be a quid, it yeah. would be a pound. And we priced everything up and, and obviously having a bit of money on the table made things interesting. <laughs> um, and of course with this type of war game you can have nuclear, chemical, biological weapons. Yeah. Obviously a chemical warhead or a, a nuclear warhead, sorry, is expensive and it's like a last resort move. <laughs> Like a sort of, okay, I surrender, but I'm going to nuke you yeah, anyway. take you with me. Um, but in those sort of, uh, what you'd call a, a competitive game, mm -hmm. you can actually roll the dice um, for every board. So you can roll the mm -hmm. dice to choose which ball so goes first. Completely randomise it. Yeah, and then you can roll a four-sided dice to actually choose which way around it goes. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, the, the, terrain, it's really good. the terrain can be completely random. And, uh, and you can play... Uh, across the width of the yes. table for an encounter game. Mm -hmm. You can uh, extend the length if you want to attack and defence. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and you can put them all together in one line. Yes. So you can have a... A real corridor one. Yeah, you can have like a, you know, a, a seven metre long war game table <laughs> with lots of different... You know, we'd actually, we'd actually have table. room in here, but shush, maybe next time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, we'll get this lot uh, finished off first. Yeah. Having gone into some generalities about this, this table, let's focus in on the town board here. Did this come from anything you'd seen or would, did you have any inspiration or was it something that just you made up on the spot? Tell me a little bit more about this board. Maybe if you can point to some of the details and some of the special things that maybe at first glance someone might not notice. Um, well, yeah, there's, there's no actual... Um, direct inspiration um, it's all sort of my own making but I guess with you know taking what, what you experience in life mm -hmm. and throwing it in the mix obviously we've got the, the rows of terraces here mm -hmm. and my parents came from the east end of London and they lived in houses quite similar to this that's kind of like home. <laughs> well, sort of. They yeah. might not like to admit that now. <laughs> Where they are now is more yes. pleasant. Um, nice. And of course, you've got the church and the churchyard and the, um, you know, the historic buildings. Old which, town. Yeah, which were probably there before you know, the modern development came. Mm -hmm. and you've got your, obviously, the, the three-bed semis. Mm -hmm. um, this, this curve actually is actually something from... Um, where, where I was brought up as a boy. Mm -hmm. And then over there we've got some slightly more industrial uh, units. Mm -hmm. And uh, and again, the sort of the, the ruined industrial area, which was always somewhere as a kid that me and my mates used to go and play, you know, mm -hmm. where you're not allowed to be. Yes. And, um, and again, the idea with this board was to to make sure that it that it flowed so that you know whichever way you whatever board connects to it it, mm -hmm. it seems to blend naturally and not have everything too too rigid and linear and um yeah it uh, it works quite well i mean one of the things with modern warfare of course is if you're if you're in this town with with troops and apcs mm -hmm. then all of the pros and cons of being in a built-up area mm -hmm. apply. Yes. However, if you're in this town in modern, with modern battle tanks, yes. then of course they've got infrared, uh -huh. image intensifying, and uh, they have obviously main guns that will fire through these buildings. Like so hiding building. behind a house doesn't work. It might work in World War II, but not in modern. Not anymore, no. 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 So the most important building on this board that I know of, never mind the church, is this little one here. Yeah. Which the, I am now zooming in on. The pub. Yes. Yeah. The pub. One of the, one of the great things about, about uh, wargaming with, with miniatures, especially at sort of a campaign level, as we're doing here, is that um, outside of, you know, obviously destroying the other side, which is a, a basic objective, mm -hmm. um, you can make the whole thing much more interesting by, by adding in um, different points of interest and, and a mixture of objectives. Mm -hmm. And um, interestingly, there's usually always a reason to go to the pub. 
And I believe you're there at the moment. Uh huh. My uh, my SES boys are in there supping pints. Are in there, right there. I haven't chatting up Maud the barmaid, I believe, is it? <laughs> yes. I think she's still there. I think she's still there, yeah. But that's brilliant. It's, again, it comes back to that storytelling aspect. The fact that the board helps the fun. It's, it helps the immersion. It helps the, the, the joy of the game. There's the, non-fun, there's the, there's the fundamentals of, of wargaming, as you said, mm. blow the other person up. But mm. then there's, there's the stuff all around the edges, which is actually what makes it fun. Absolutely. And, and having a board like this is absolutely central to having fun, I think. Yeah. And having touches like that pub and the fact that it's got a little kind of like table with, uh, I mean, the details, the little touches, they, they mean that you can imagine going in there for a pint yourself. Frankly. Yeah, there's, it's even got the, the it's got a little sign. sign. The front, I will. I, I will making. try and. I'll try and get a photograph. I don't think I'll be able to focus on that with the with the camera. But that's that's brilliant. Thank you. So far, we've had a lot of conversation about the terrain, and we have touched a little on the game that's being played over it. So what would be nice now is to go over the game as it stands. We're on turn three, the beginning of, I think. Four. Turn four, the beginning of, yeah. and it's been three months, I think, since we started playing. We don't get much time <laughs> to do this. What we have at the back here is Lee's dirty Russians that are hiding just behind the, the brow of a hill. And what they're attempting to do is dominate this valley, which has my pure British driving like hell for leather and attempting to get to their objective. Now that touches on one of the first things about this game, which sets it apart from a lot of other war games that I've played. It's very objective driven and it's designed to avoid that God effect that you have. Yeah. So why don't we begin talking about the game we're playing now by touching on that aspect of the rules and, and how that's impacted what's going on. Okay. Um... Yeah, the God effect, uh, <laughs> it's a strange, a strange term, um, but essentially we're, we're trying to simulate um, two battle groups coming into contact on the ground. And the, um, obviously, we're, we're standing above it, we can see everything. Um, one of the key things that we, we started with was that we wrote down, obviously once we knew our objectives, as well as um, blowing each other to smithereens, there's various objectives. The lighthouse is one, the pub of course is one, hmm. the manor house in the centre I think has got some secret documents or a spy in there. Or yeah, but there's big, there's big negatives for blowing it up I believe. That's right, yeah, nuking, nuking the manor house is a no-no. Yeah. Um, There's and a, in the farm over there, there was also a, which you've done, I think, haven't you? A, a spy or something else yeah. that, uh, that I've acquired. And um, then there's some documents in this building here, isn't there? Yes, in the uh, the radar. Yeah. Sense, yeah. So five different objectives, each yes. giving different points for victory points. Yes. And of course, at the beginning of the game, we every battle group is is split down into. Um, you know, tank squadrons and platoons, and, and down to squads of men, and even mm -hmm. you know a, individual a pair, vehicles. Uh, yeah. Individual vehicles. You know, Land Rover with two observers, like this poor sod here. Yeah, <laughs> and, um, and so you write down your orders for these people, for these different segments of your battle group, and the uh, the reason for doing that is that. Um, as players, we can see what's going to unfold, hmm. but their orders are, you know, from from objective A to objective B, you know, you go there and you hold, or you're going to lay down covering fire, or you're going to be an observer to call in artillery strikes or, or aircraft fly past. And um, the rules are, uh, are quite skilled at, at removing um, the, the God factor so that you are actually getting a, a realistic simulation. So I'm moving very slowly around here so I can point to a specific example of how this has actually worked very well. 
down here we have Steve, poor Steve. Steve was driving in a very lightly armoured recce vehicle. It's got a big gun, but it's a scorpion tank. A scorpion tank. And their instructions, him and his mate, Dave, who is the one that's on his side over there, who also hasn't done very well, their orders were to scoot up along this and get to that field over there. Now I wrote those orders and off they went merrily on their way. But little did they know that, unfortunately, Lee had given orders to this pile of actual proper main battle tanks. Now, I could see that coming, obviously, but the orders were given, and there was no way of me warning, because there was no way of me having seen them by any of my units on the table. Therefore, I wasn't able to get on the main net and say, oh, by the way, Steve, you might want to turn around and come back, lad. So he carried on his merry way, and now we have two dead scorpion tanks. And, and that is really a lovely example and demonstration of just how it gets rid of that, that thing where you've got that ever seeing eye, you've got the, you can always plan your strategy with perfect knowledge. There are other rules that attempt to challenge this, so where you have an uncertainty value of, of or some uncertainty of your orders actually reaching your troops. Uh, and this also has that where you can attempt to um, jam yeah, the radio the net. Electronic uh, warfare, which obviously is a growing phenomenon. So this is it. But it doesn't. But even that doesn't cal cater for the fact that you've got an, a god view of the battlefield, and you can see things that you'd never be able to see in real life because you've given the orders. They're just going to go away and complete them. Yes. And it's only when something happens for your little men on the table that means that you could potentially change those orders that you're then able to go and change them. So you mm -hmm. sit there and you merrily drive in your little tank towards death. Nothing you can do about it. And, I've, and that's yeah. a, I've, I've not come across another rule set that captures that quite so effectively and has given us fun. I mean, we talk about Steve all the time, don't we? It's, <laughs> yeah, it's, it. it's actually his wife, Maud, who is, uh, who is in the pub with my SES lads. <laughs> another example of how fun is... What you make of it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the the, the idea is that uh, you know, if if this uh, you know squad of Challenger twos acquire those targets, there, obviously on their local radio net, mm -hmm. they're going to quickly tell their mates. That, mm. you know, By the way, there's a bunch of T72s over there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, their ability to transfer that information uh, through the network to Battle Group HQ, which is. Yeah us as, yes. as the bosses, if you like, um, is not guaranteed. Mm. And this is modern warfare. So mm. uh, as well as um, uh, obviously equipment failure, mm. being out of command and communication range, there is also the fact that my Russians are trying to send you uh, Balkan folk music and you're trying to send me Slayer. Yes. And uh, sometimes when you get on the radio, it's not always what you expect. Or the archers. Or the archers. <laughs> <laughs> it's brilliant. And it works so well. And we're having a lot of fun. I mean, it is a very slow game because we have very little time to spend playing it. But also, how the rules work could seem a bit bookkeepery. But because we make it fun, we're having a lot of fun as well. I think there could be some people who might find it a bit heavy. But I find, I'm finding a lot of fun and I'm looking forward to this turn that's coming up. So what we'll do is we'll cut to our final shot. We'll talk a little bit about the actual rules. And then, wouldn't you know, we'll actually roll some dice and play this thing. Good God. <laughs> <laughs> right, let's talk about the actual rule set. This is called Challenger 2000. And there is the rule book. I will put a link to this on Board Game Geek in the description so if you're interested you can go and find that on there and, uh, and talk to other people that may be playing it it does have some ratings and there are other people out there playing it do you want to quickly talk through the rules and explain how you found it and give a quick flavor of what it's like to play and, and some of the mechanics okay well yeah challenger 2000 i mean um uh, written by a guy called bruce reed taylor and Bob Connor, I think Bruce Rea Taylor was the was the key man. I, this was written before we had mobile phones and word processing, etc. Obviously, it was uh, quite a challenge. 
When I had problems with these rules, I actually phoned Bruce at his home and he was very generous with his time. You've got to love gaming, haven't you? Yeah, it's, absolutely. Absolutely. it's always yeah. been a great community. Yeah. Um, so how does it work? Tell me, so you, you, you pick your, your side, there's uh, an equipment handbook which gives you statistics yeah. for... Yeah, the, about that. the modern equipment handbook is essentially... I mean, up until 95, you know, 2000-ish, we've got all of the equipment from all of the armies around the world. And so, for example, we've got the Challenger 2 here, and it's listed down as um, uh, either 680 or 330 points. So you could make that £3.30 mm -hmm. or, or three groves or yeah. you know, however you want to do it. So, And each of these has statistics for armour based on which part of the tank is hit. Yeah, absolutely. What type of gun it's got, what type of... Um, the rounds it round can fire, can fire, its targeting the system. The speed it can go. Yeah, the stabilisation on the gun, which affects its accuracy when it's travelling at full speed over rough Chemical, terrain. biological. All of the rounds it can fire, yes, its ability to withstand those mm. horrific sort of incoming attacks. So there's a lot of numbers. There's a lot of numbers, yeah. yeah. And, and, and then it gets even more interesting with numbers. Yeah. Then I mean, there is the tables. <laughs> That's right. These are the, we uh, spent some time looking at these sheets. These are the quick reference guides. Quick. Which, which, <laughs> which um, when you're playing the game... It is, isn't it? I'm joking. It, it, does, quite it does get more pacey. So let's have a quick look at one of these and just quickly talk through. So, for example, if we are looking at, we've mentioned it a few times in this video, at acquisition. This is my tank can see your tank and it knows you're there and therefore it might be able to fire at it. Mm -hmm. That's what acquisition is. Yeah. You can, you, you roll d20s for this, so it's, it's based on d20s. Mm -hmm. And you have how far away you are from the thing you're trying to see. That gives you your base number and also based on how much of the vehicle you're looking at, you can potentially see. So if it's just a turret or is it the entire body or whatever, is it behind a hill and that mm -hmm. sort of stuff. And the size of and the, the size vehicle, of the vehicle yeah. initially. And then there's a whole list of other modifiers based on whether you're moving, whether they're moving, whether they've shot, whether you've shot, whether, mm -hmm. been, whether it's been reported on your main net. Mm -hmm. So there's a whole bunch of other modifiers that go and then as simple as that is you roll a d20 and if you make the number you've done it yeah so it's the beginning of it can be quite tough so for example as you've seen on the table we have a group of tanks that are all quite close together so we can say we can we can work out the modifiers and then use roughly the same modifier for every roll and therefore it goes bam 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 so once yeah. you've worked out your range and which ones moved and which ones didn't, mm. then it's pretty quick, like you say. Yes. And it's pretty logical as well. If you've, um, if if this if the, your target has only just come into sight, it's harder to see. It's yeah. not been there for the entirety of the time, where, which you've had the to look for it. The move, that's exactly. right. And, and going out of sight as well. So it's pretty. So, it's um, pretty logical, and the penetration yeah. is the same. We haven't yet got to uh, the um, aeroplanes and. Other things which will come Yeah, that's through. right. The aircraft and artillery are, are arriving in the beginning of this move. Yes. And that's when things get even more complicated. And I have some tornadoes and some Harriers and I cannot wait to kill these. <laughs> <laughs> and, you, and you have some pretty hefty kit as well. I, I've got some pretty nasty kit, yeah. I've got some, uh, some MiGs and I've got a hind gunship which is going to arrive yeah. Uh, this move. Yes. Um, I won't tell you where it's heading. But <laughs> I think you'll find it inconvenient. <laughs> I think I know where it's heading. So, there we are. Let's uh, wrap this up now and roll some dice and have some fun. I hope you've enjoyed that video. It's been really good having you to join me on, on Beard Clipper. It's a pleasure to have you as my first guest. Thank you very much. Um, yeah. Yes, and um, we will hopefully do some bat reports or some gameplay videos at some point, but it's not going to be anytime soon. It probably won't be for, for months, to be fair, just because of our schedules. And we will want to get the game we're playing now out of the way so we can bring you along for the entire journey and not drop you in turn four or two and a half months in. So if you have not yet subscribed, please do so. I do love seeing those numbers go up. I think it's above 90 now, which is just beyond belief for me. And once you have subscribed, don't forget to hit that bell. That will tell you when there is a new video uploaded. And leave a comment below. Have you played anything like this before? Or is it of interest to you? 
do you think it looks rubbish? I just If you have any comments at all, pop them in the comments below and I'll be happy to engage with you there. So once again, thank you very much for watching Beard Clipper.